Here I present to you my reasoning as to why multiple GPUs in a single desktop or gaming system, even in consoles and mobile computing, is the future. Let me provide you with my thinking and see if you agree. First, we should look at the common arguments made against multiple GPUs. It's too hard for developers, so they don't want to do it. The install base is too small for developers to bother with. Not all games support it, so it's a waste. It doesn't do much for 0.1 lows and micro stuttering. In fact, maybe it makes it worse. AMD and Nvidia don't support it now anyway. The new multi-GPU programming paths in Vulkan and DX12 are even harder for developers, so they definitely won't use them now. Well, let's see how those arguments stack up. The original multiple GPU systems for home computers was SLI, Scanline Interleave, created by 3DFX and released with their Voodoo 2 cards. With dual cards in a system, one would draw the top of the frame and the other would draw the bottom. Downsides to this were the cost and the complexity of having three video cards in a system as the Voodoo cards did not offer any 2D functionality. Plus, the only programming API that supported this was 3DFX's own proprietary Glide API. Then came the limited game support. Only about 200 games ever used Glide and the industry largely moved away to Microsoft's Direct3D. The last games supporting Glide were released in 2002 and the death of 3DFX and the API signaled the beginning of a long hibernation period for SLI. With the shift to DirectX, it didn't become too hard to program multiple GPUs. It became impossible. Functionality moved from an accessible API to be hidden away in drivers provided by manufacturers. Your DirectX or OpenGL application only saw one graphics device. You wrote to it like you wrote to a single GPU. This was supposed to make things easy and encourage multiple GPUs, but it had the opposite effect. Suddenly Nvidia, Intel, ATI had to code exceptions, paths and optimizations for every single game released. A completely untenable situation. Instead of thousands of developers working on this, you only had two companies and they were bottlenecked. The fact that multiple GPU support is no longer inside the graphics card driver doesn't mean you can't do the old school SLI anymore. In DirectX 12, for example, you can assign all of your GPUs to a single linked node adapter device. Two identical GPUs then render alternate frames, just as the old SLI. But the huge advantage is that the memory synchronization between GPUs does not have to go through system memory anymore, which means a lot of the latency issues that we saw with SLI previously have gone away. The install base is too small. Chicken, meat, egg. If the technology has been terrible for close to two decades, not many people will be excited for it. But as DirectX 12 and Vulkan games become more common, and as developers become more comfortable with what is possible, and as the big game engines bake in the support, we will see more compelling results. All it takes, really, is a couple of breakthrough demonstrations to get people hyped, and demand will shift. We've seen some acceptable scaling in MGPU-compatible DX12 titles, such as Deus Ex Mankind Divided, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, 1.6 to 1.8 times scaling on those titles depending on the CPU and drivers. Strange Brigade was the first game with MGPU support under Vulkan, whereas the DirectX 12 games so far have used a pretty basic alternate frame method. AMD spent development time to really showcase what was possible here. Not only a solid implementation, but they allowed mismatched GPUs to operate together. As a result of the time taken to optimize this title, you can expect a 90% scaling, or even more. Now at the low end, a 66% performance increase isn't incredible, but when was the last time a GPU upgrade gave you a 66% better performance over your old card? That might normally be a 2-3 year upgrade cycle. Not all games support it, so it's a waste. And that was true back when the software stack for it was no good. Lack of developer effort was partly down to a shallow ecosystem, but also because developers weren't getting the best possible experience for the users. Plenty of developers want to create something that scales and shows off their work on the highest possible systems, even if only a small percentage of users have them. But if the experience is less than perfect on an extremely high-end system, then it reflects poorly on everything else that they've done. But time changes everything. Any title developed with DirectX 12 or Vulkan can offer MGPU support and do it well. Developers can use any method that serves their purpose and which provides the best end user experience. The reason older SLI methods might display micro stuttering, lobe 0.1 times, possibly even worse than on single GPUs, is because all the data used by the game has to be copied to two GPUs and kept in perfect sync. The game or other software had no control over this. The synchronization problem was down to the driver and in Windows. It added latency and more chance for a frame stall as it waited for new data to copy to the other GPU. 
This was a problem inherent not to multiple GPUs, it was a problem in the implementation from the ground up. Looking at the recent examples of Deus Ex, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Strange Brigade, we see minimum frame rates in all cases actually improve over a single GPU. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider 4K Ultra, minimum frame rates jump from about 40 to 80 frames per second. In Strange Brigade, as tested with mismatched Vega cards, they saw a boost in 0.1 lows from 47 to 52 FPS. Sniper Elite 4, with two GTX 1080 cards, manages to maintain average frame times as low as 7.5 milliseconds in small rooms and around 10 in outdoor areas, easily sitting above 100 frames per second at 4K, on average. This beats the performance of a $1200 RTX 2080 Ti. Remarkably, even at 8K resolution, two GTX 1080 cards provide somewhat playable performance at 30 to 40 frames a second. Benchmarks at Gamers Nexus show 0.1 lows for two stock GTX 1080 Ti's at 6% better than a 2080 Ti Founders Edition. Average performance far higher than even a 144Hz monitor would support. So it is better provided you use a modern day API. Multiple GPUs no longer worsen freight times. It was certainly possible for that to happen with older GPUs and drivers, but those days, thankfully, are over. If it happens now, it's a bug. It's not a fundamental fact of life that you need to put up with. Some have said DirectX 12 and Vulkan make it even harder for developers to program for multiple GPUs, but that's not at all the case. If you want to use an alternate frame system like in the old DirectX 11 days, that's still perfectly open to you. Configure your GPUs in linked mode and they act just like old SLI, with the only difference being much better latencies now. It wasn't the programming for it was hard before, it was just that it was impossible. You had no access to the individual GPU devices. And while you can still do it the old way and get better results now with the new APIs, you're not limited to that. Which is great because the old way is not particularly efficient. Your GPUs have to be of roughly equal performance. They have to have the same VRAM because it's going to be duplicated between the two cards. So there's absolutely no increase to programming complexity by enabling multiple GPU in these new APIs. But that's not really where it gets interesting. The new APIs enable what's called unlinked mode. As the name suggests, you can access each GPU or compute device individually. As an example of what might be possible, take this extreme hypothetical. Your heads-up display and minimap could be rendered by an integrated GPU. You could have two discrete GPUs handling traditional rasterization in AFI SLI. You could even throw in your old GPU from your last system to do ray-traced audio and some physics calculations. And then let's say you had a spare RTX card just for DLS upscaling. But what might be the most relevant application for us is ray tracing. It scales near perfectly over multiple computing devices, and it is unquestionably the future of real-time graphics. For developers who routinely write multi-threaded code that mimics the physical interactions between light and materials in 3D space, setting up an efficient multi-GPU pipeline isn't an insurmountable task. But it's not even something that has to be redeveloped with each game. Game engines are already full of code that gets reused, a good multi-GPU implementation would be added once to an engine and then tweaked as needed for all new games that use it. It's the best way to scale performance. The basic rule of computing is if you want more performance, you have to add more devices. There's only so far you can go by increasing frequency and Moore's Law stopped years ago. Servers went multi-socket, CPUs went multi-core, and GPUs are going to need a similar architectural revolution. Yes, we have to develop algorithms to better move data and schedule tasks, but that's been at the heart of computing since forever. It's true of multi-core mobile phones and 100,000 CPU supercomputers. But because something's hard isn't an argument for not doing it. It's the best way to scale the processing, so that's what's going to happen. The ever-increasing difficulty in hitting ever higher clock speeds at ever smaller transistor sizes is a reason that we're going to have to move down a path of multiple GPUs. But one practical reason it will be good for us is something like VR, where we can have one GPU powering each eye. It is the best way to scale performance. And this might be the most important note. We scale memory by adding RAM chips and DIMMs. We scale storage by adding storage devices, be that platters or extra drives and striping over them. We scale processing by adding cores and sockets and we scale computing by adding servers and interconnecting them. The basic rule of computing is if you want more performance, you need more devices. If you agree that physics is a real thing, you have to acknowledge parallelism is needed to solve future computing challenges, with ray tracing chief among them. 
it's an absolute necessity for the cloud. Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and more are actively working on game streaming services, and this will become a big deal in the next few years. Fully cloud-based games will be common, and we may see cloud-supported games, where the game runs locally but some latency-tolerant processing or rendering is handed off to the cloud. This was the promise of Microsoft's crackdown. It hasn't yet materialized, but it will in the future. But in the data center, power efficiency is king. If you're going to stream games to tens of thousands of users, you cannot use cards that need dual slot or even triple slot fans. You'd need too much space and the power cost would be prohibitive. You need to pack as many chips as close together as you can, and they have to operate at efficient clock speeds. That means multiple GPU cores on a card, multiple GPU cores on a die, or both, running at a clock speed that offers the highest performance per watt. Every overclocker knows it's not long before the power draw increases outstrip your performance gains. Many overclockers will list the power draw of an overclocked chip. It's very rare they include the power costs of the cooling. A heavily overclocked GPU chip might be pulling 300, 400, even close to 500 watts into the card, but then you have to add the power draw of the fans, the chiller, the pumps, the LN2, the refrigeration units to freeze your ice, and even the room AC. At that point you get the true power draw of your card. For power efficiency you have to go wide and spread the workload out, not just up. This isn't at all new. Distributing workloads has been central to high-performance computing since about 1964 and the release of the Cray CDC 6600, which sent workloads to peripheral computing elements. A lot of research goes into making transistors and chips faster, but a comparable amount goes into the interconnects and communication protocols which bind them. In the HPC space, we have InfiniBand, OmniPath, Ares, Sunway, and custom options for interchassis connections with tens or hundreds of gigabits per second low latency communication. Inside a chassis connecting the CPU, memory and other components, we have PCI Express, QPI, Infinity Fabric. It's the quiet work going on there that tells us about the future of graphics. PCIe 4 and 5 are coming, and we have AMD's XGMI, NVIDIA's NVLink, and Intel has revealed they are working on CXL. NVIDIA's $7 billion purchase of Mellanox is an indication that they're trying to catch up to AMD and Intel in this space. All three of those companies are members of the PCI Express Working Group, and the point of all this work is to ensure a large number of devices can communicate at high speed and with low latency. You only need to do that if you want multiple devices talking to each other. If you are just going to keep making single GPUs and their local memory faster, we can sit around on PCI Express 3, 16 lanes all day and be happy but that's going to stall. To get fast, and I mean really fast, we need to build small, fast, efficient packages and scale them out with equally fast and efficient interconnects so they can directly share memory. Under SLI and DirectX 11, each GPU needed to maintain an exact copy of the VRAM. That meant if you had a four gig GPU and added another four gig GPU, you still only had four gig of total VRAM to use. Or if you had a four gig GPU and added an eight gig GPU, you still only had 4 gig of VRAM to use. Newer APIs improve that. Each individual GPU can be given different tasks and can operate off different memory sets. This increases the amount of VRAM you have in total. The real long-term goal of XGMI and CXL is for the interconnect to be so fast each GPU can add its VRAM into a shared unified pool. The advantages of being able to increase not just your processing but also increase your available VRAM just by adding GPUs is pretty obvious. Allocating a task to a GPU should be no more difficult or costly than allocating threads to a CPU core. This is already driving areas of computing including machine learning and visualization. And it's already happening for gamers too. Google is using dual GPU Radeon Pro V340 cards to power their cloud-based gaming system Stadia. They also require developers use the Vulkan API which opens up each GPU device for direct access by applications. They even showed off Firestrike scaling over multiple GPUs in their announcement. Suddenly every single gamer on Stadia has multi-GPUs at their disposal. The install base for SLI jumps from not many to practically everybody. Not only do developers want to make the best experience possible, but Google wouldn't mind at all if people wanted to jump into their higher tier subscriptions. Explicit multi-GPU is the future simply because of cloud computing. You'll benefit from it even if you never put another GPU in your system. But for people deciding on a multiple GPU build, you would be doing so at the dawn of a new age. One where after almost 20 years, it once again brings real benefits.